If you could get a time machine and go back a few hundred or a few thousand years, the first thing you would notice was just how few people there were. Wilderness was everywhere. It dominated the landscape. Most people lived in tiny farming villages, and to travel from one village to another usually meant traveling through some stretch of wilderness, either forest or swamp or grassland. And you'd be forgiven for not realizing that there were any cities, because what they called cities back then, even as recently as a few hundred years ago, would seem to us today, with very few exceptions, to be no more than small towns. And what I want to do in this video is talk about why. Why was the world population so low for so long? Why did it start to grow? And why is it that in the past century or so, the global population spiked so dramatically? It has to do with the carrying capacity of the land. How many people a given area of land can sustain? How many calories are produced per acre or per hectare? In a hunting and gathering economy, when people are foraging from the environment and just taking from the environment what the environment provides naturally, then the carrying capacity of the land is much less. And so in areas where people are hunting and gathering, the population density is very, very low. And then farming emerged nine or 10,000 years ago. And, uh, and at first it started out in this one area in the Near East. And then over the next few thousand years, it popped up independently in other places like China and in South America and in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. And in those areas where farming developed, that allowed for a larger population because the productivity of the land was being changed. Instead of the land being a natural environment with its own ecosystem, supporting lots of different types of animals and plants, uh, some of those animals and plants would have been useful to humans, but many others would not have been. With farming, what you do when you switch to farming is you remove all the plants and animals that are not useful to humans, and you only plant food crops. And you, you deliberately go in there and remove any plants that try to compete with food crops. That's called weeding. So that's the invention of weeds is when people started farming and then any plants that were not useful to humans were getting in the, in the way of the food crops. Those were now weeds. Weeds are our common enemy, plaguing the homeowner, ruining golf courses and our tempers, cursing us with hay fever, piling up work by millions of man hours for railroads and highway maintenance departments. But worst of all is their never-ending warfare against the American farmer. And so essentially farming involves a dramatic change of the ecosystem to make a completely human-centric. That's the idea of farming. And because of that, you could have a lot more calories per acre. And because far more food was being produced in a given area, that meant that a lot more people could live in that area. So population could increase. As farming moved to new areas, that allowed for more and more population. And the population increase you observe on the graph here is new areas coming under cultivation. And then you can see the population kind of plateau between 500 BC and uh, AD 1000. The population is more or less is slowly climbing upward. There were incremental changes that allowed for modest increases in food productivity, which then translated into modest increases in population. Uh, the introduction of new technologies into new areas. Oh, one example of this is the adoption of the iron plow in Northern Europe that allowed for uh, many new areas in Northern Europe to come under cultivation rather than being forest or uh, peat bogs or, or whatever. They could then become farms during the Middle Ages. Uh, another example of this, and a very notable example of this, is the introduction of new strains of rice from Vietnam into China during the Song Dynasty. So we're talking like 11th, 12th century uh, AD. Uh, and and that, that allowed for a dramatic increase in the amount of food being produced in China, which then allowed for a much larger population of China. And the, the population of China roughly doubled between the year 1000 and the year 1200. And then it fell again in the 1200s and 1300s because of the Mongols and because of other things. But the point is, whatever the population level was, 
was at that level because of how much food could be produced given the level of technology, given how much area was under cultivation, and given what types of crops were being produced in a given region. Now that point about the kind of crops you're raising, that's a really key point because some food crops will produce more calories than others. And there's a notable increase in population from say about 1600-ish on that's when you start to really see a, a dramatic rise in population well above previous levels. And the reason for that was the introduction of new food crops into different parts of the world. This followed on the European arrival in the Americas from 1492 onward. You know, so Columbus sailed across the Atlantic and uh, found the Americas. But one key development that came out of European colonization in the Americas was the discovery by the Europeans of lots of new foods that no one in the Eastern Hemisphere had encountered before. Potatoes from South America, for example, peppers from Mesoamerica, from Mexico and Central America, tomatoes from Mexico, corn from Mesoamerica, corn, what, we, what Americans call corn or maize, beans from South America, and it was particularly those South American crops of beans and potatoes that were really key in leading to a surge of population growth following the discovery of America. Betsy, look at these beans. We must plant some of them. Oh, Bill, we must plant corn, too. Hello, everybody. Well, what are you doing? We're planting a vegetable garden. We want to grow beans, tomatoes, potatoes, and pumpkins in the garden. I like some pumpkin pie. And this is referred to as the Columbian Exchange, the transfer of organisms between the two hemispheres. Food crops being introduced from North and South America to the rest of the world, and then grain crops like wheat and rice being introduced into the Americas from the Eastern Hemisphere, along with cattle and pigs and goats. And then lots of diseases were also introduced from the Eastern Hemisphere into the Western Hemisphere. But as far as the growth of the human population is concerned, the big key thing here is the food crops from South America. They were introduced to other parts of the world. And a lot of those crops are very efficient in terms of producing calories per acre. And uh, so, for example, you know, it's very famous among English speakers that Ireland, in Ireland, they grew a lot of potatoes. And uh, potatoes are not actually native to Ireland. They are native to South America. They were introduced into Ireland in the 17th century. Uh, but they became a staple crop in Ireland because they produce so much nutrition per acre planted or per hectare planted. Um, and, and this pattern repeated itself over and over again across the Eastern Hemisphere, where potatoes were adopted into cuisines across Asia and Africa. Peanuts are another thing. Peanuts come from South America. They were introduced into cuisines in different parts of the world. They became really central to the cuisines of Africa, as did maize uh, in you know many parts of the world. All these new food crops were introduced into Europe, Africa, and Asia that gave more food security, produced more food per uh, given land area, and that allowed for an increase in the population. The potato was brought from its native home in Peru to Spain, and in time back to America, and now spreads its green over countless acres throughout the world. A universal food for the millions and the millionaires. Not all the gold that Pizarro plundered from the Incas can compare with the wealth that a peaceful monk took from Peru, impoverishing no one, but enriching all mankind. Now, just to give you some ballpark figures, because I haven't used any numbers yet, uh, back, way back, 10,000, 15,000 years ago, global population was probably a few million total around the world. And then the continental glaciers retreated, agriculture began, and then global populations started to rise because more and more areas are adopting farming. So it's estimated that around 3000 BC, there were maybe 20 million human beings or 40 million human beings somewhere in that ballpark. Then fast forward 3000 years, you get to the time of Christ, 
um, or the time of Augustus Caesar, if you want to be more secular. At that point, uh, global population was somewhere around 200 to 300 million people. And then global population stayed at about that level, about 200, 250 million, 300 million for uh, more than a thousand years. After the year 1000, the human population inched upward to about 350 or 400 million. Uh, there seems to have been a pullback during the 1300s because of the, the Black Death, but then it went up again. And around the time of Columbus, roughly the year 1500, global population was around 450 million, give or take. The world reached the uh, milestone of 500 million people sometime probably in the 16th century. And global population kept climbing. It reached 600 million in around the year 1700. And then during the course of the 18th century, it went past the 700 million, 800 million, 900 million milestones. And global population reached 1 billion for the first time at the beginning of the 1800s. But then in the 1800s, growth accelerated even faster. It took about 125 years to go from 1 billion to 2 billion. But then to go from 2 billion to 3 billion took about 30 years. And then from 3 billion to 4 billion took 15 years. And then from then on, during, from the 1970s up until the present, we've added another billion people to the world's population every 12 to 15 years. Today, you and I live in a period of tremendous growth, which confronts us with many problems. Now, what accounts for that astoundingly rapid growth during the 20th century? The reason is industrialization. Industrialization happened in the 1800s and 1900s when new energy sources were discovered that allowed for a rapid increase in the amount of stuff that could be produced. In other words, it allowed for a rapid increase in our productive capacity as a species. Now, this affected agricultural production because those technologies could be used either directly or indirectly to promote the expansion of the food supply. It would happen directly through the application of new machinery to farm work, you know, the introduction of the mechanical tractors, for example, or various other agricultural machinery, but also indirectly through supply chains. Now we had trains and steamships that could move freight uh, relatively cheaply and quickly compared to before. So it was now possible, where it had not been possible before, it was now possible to move large amounts of food long distances. Some parts of the world, like the American Midwest, became bread baskets, but not just the American Midwest. There were other parts of the world where that happened too, like Argentina, uh, Eastern Europe, where they were able to produce huge amounts of food, not just for their own production, but for export. But also one outcome or you know, one aspect of the Industrial Revolution was the development of the modern chemical industry, which led, among other things, to, to the development of modern fertilizers, which then heightened the productivity of farmland. Siva Raman congratulated the villagers on their industry in preparing compost and green manure. But there is still another way to improve your crops. He showed the villagers a sample of ammonium sulfate a chemical from the big new fertilizer plant at Sindri in the state of Bihar. This will be magic in your soil. The compost and green manure give strength to the land. The ammonium sulfate will give quick fertility. So these new technologies are responsible for that huge spike that happens at the end of that graph. Now, of course, that's only true for as long as we have high food production. And that high amount of food production is dependent upon our modern industrialized economy. So if something were to happen to that, if some catastrophe or something were to happen to break down our modern industrial economy, um, the, we would not be able to sustain the level of population we have right now. Food production would drop dramatically because our amount of food production and food availability is dependent upon our modern industrialized system. So if we were somehow to go back to a pre-industrial economy on a global scale, we would have to shed 80 or 90 percent of our population in order to make that work. We have nowadays people who like to go off the grid or try to live more simply, who go out and start a farm and try to live a subsistence lifestyle, and that's great, and that works on an individual level. But that would be impossible to do on a global scale for everyone to go and do that. 
we'd have to have this highly mechanized, highly industrialized agricultural economy, an agricultural industrial complex, so to speak. Uh, that's the only way to maintain a population of billions. Stuart, every time I think of how many civilizations have crumbled, fallen apart, rotted from the inside or cracked from the outside, I shudder when I pick up the front page of a newspaper. But anyway, that's what I've got for now. Thanks for watching. These are jack-o'-lanterns that Betsy and I grew. Now you know why people feel like celebrating at harvest time. All over the world, people have feasting and good times when the crops have been gathered in. Our feast is ready. Bill, you can take the corn out now. Watch out. The ears are hot. I like some pumpkin pie.